p.m. on December 28, 2017, 19-year-old Natalie Bollinger messaged her close friend, Tim Beeson, to confirm their plans for a motorcycle ride later that day. It was midwinter in Broomfield, Colorado, a town that sits midway between Denver and Boulder, but the weather that day was mild. And Natalie was ready to get out. It had been a tough year for the teenager, she'd recently enrolled in a college to study nursing, a lifelong goal, and was keen to start her studies. But a consistent sense of dread was making it hard to enjoy, even the smallest things. Sometimes, she even feared for her life. At 9.06 a.m., Tim wrote, Just let me know when you want to go, I'll come pick you up. Natalie replied okay at 9.58 a.m., Natalie messaged him again and said she needed to take care of a few things first, and then she'd be in touch. Four hours passed with no word from Natalie, Tim assumed that she had gotten caught up in something else. Guess I'll just wait for you to hit me up when you've got time, he wrote. Tim sent one more message to Natalie's phone that day, it was 5.22 p.m., this time it wasn't to Natalie, but to Joey Moreno, Natalie's live-in boyfriend. The message read, has she been found? Natalie's boyfriend, Joey, had called Tim earlier in the day, around 3 p.m., asking if Natalie was with him. Tim said that she wasn't. Joey was clearly concerned, he said that Natalie had left the house around lunchtime, but hadn't taken her phone with her. She had however, taken his Glock 9mm gun. Nobody had seen or heard from her since. At 3.30 p.m., Joey notified the local police. Of course, not being able to reach someone, is no big cause for alarm, but in Natalie's case it was. And it was all because of this man. Turning a blind fucking eye, you piece of shit! Go to hell! Go to hell! Go to hell! Go to hell! You can help me die! You can help end this stuff! You don't want to do either! You son of a bitch! Yep, Natalie had a stalker. 42-year-old Sean Schwartz was a homeless man she had known since she was 13 years old. Just five days earlier, Sean was issued with a restraining order, but he had already violated it, with threats of hunting down and killing both Tim Beeson and her father. Two weeks earlier, Natalie posted an announcement on her Facebook page. This was one of her last posts. Hey y'all, I have a public announcement. There is a man Sean Schwartz. I met this man when I was young. I ran into him about two years ago. Long story short, I became friends with him. I helped him out with rides and stuff. I moved to Virginia. He drove across the country to see me slept behind my work for weeks. When I told him I didn't want to see him anymore, he sent me hundreds of texts and calls. He parked his car in front of my house, blocking military highway for hours, laying on his horn. He was arrested. Since then, I've asked him to leave me alone, and he won't. He sent emails for over a year, close to every day, harassing me, making numerous accounts until I block him again, threatening my family. Telling me he'd kill himself in front of me, and sending my friends and family harassing messages as well. I'm sharing this because he's posting slander about me all over Facebook. So if you receive a message, I am sincerely sorry. Please ignore him, it only encourages him when he gets a response, much like a child, he's mentally ill and I'm trying to fix this. Bortz had created a fake profile and was commenting on the Facebook post, defending himself, and telling Natalie and her friends to re-examine their intentions. It's not known how long he'd been friends with her on the social media channel. The day after, Natalie went missing. Strangely, Sean was one of the first people to share the news on Facebook that Natalie was missing. He was asking people for help in finding her. He had forgotten that to Natalie and everyone who knew her, he was a stalker, capable of anything. In one video he offered to lend Natalie some money if she needed somewhere safe to go. Needless to say, suspicions all fell on him. Don't know if 
this probably won't go to manually, but just in case, um, I get like $705 a month for having Asperger's, and I, I, my January money, I didn't, I didn't pay all my bills, I still got like $300 left on that, so, and for the help you to get some more safe, I got, I got money I can send you to be safe. December 29th, the Adams County Sheriff's Office announced that the body of a young woman had been found by a passerby in a wooded area near a dairy farm, not far from Natalie's home. The body would later be confirmed as being Natalie, she died from a single gunshot wound to the head. Casings from a Glock 9mm were found there at the scene. She also had a potentially fatal dose of H in her system. Police would not officially confirm the identity of the body until January 2, 2018. Someone else would publicly announce it long before police, and the police were quick to name Sean as a person of interest. Like I said, police quickly made Schwartz the number one suspect, and the news was quickly out. But, on January the 8th, Sean was cleared by the police as a person of interest. It seems that Sean had been in another state, at the time of her disappearance. People were in shock, and didn't want to believe, or forgive him. Sean may not have taken her life, but people knew about his mental health issues. And also, I've been instructed not to speak to y'all, but I got a few more fingers for you. Well, do you know what happened to her? No. You know who does? Tell me. How would I know? What happened to Natalie? What do you guys know? All I know is from Facebook Messenger. And I hate Facebook. What did Facebook Messenger say? It doesn't matter. You need to get a hold of the police and talk to them. As it would turn out, Sean had met both Natalie and her twin sister Alicia in downtown Boulder in an area known as a hangout spot for the homeless. This place was full of addicts and both the twins would smoke grass and sell it for their father. To show that he wasn't lying, he posted an email online, allegedly sent to him from Natalie, dated July 30, 2016. In it, she talked about her strange and wild childhood, in the email she wrote that her dad was violent, and that her mom had left, when she was just three years old. Her and her sister bounced back and forth between two different homes for years. Her dad did illegal substances, and often had the twins sell them for him. They were later removed from his home and placed in foster care. She had become a great friend to him, who would help him out and give him rides. They messaged each other regularly and supported each other through their mental health issues. Schwartz suffered from panic attacks while Natalie's friends confirmed that Natalie had suffered mental health issues. Day after her body was found, her father, Ted Bollinger, set up a GoFundMe page, and needless to say, this put him as suspect number two. Internet sleuths started digging up every piece of dirt about Ted's past, and it was extremely stained. Ted had a long list of criminal convictions and had been to jail several times. His convictions were charges of child abuse, assault, and illegal narcotic dealing. But as the sleuths and police thought they were making headway with Ted, a twist in the case arised. Police had been looking into Natalie's phone calls in the days prior, and a certain phone number would stand out. In the days through December 28th, Natalie had exchanged 111 messages with a certain phone number. That number was owned by Joseph Michael Lopez. The day after Natalie's body was found, Lopez was at work, and just started puking, and then took the rest of the week off. Nobody knew who Lopez was, and it seemed to be that this was the first time they had ever interacted. Police checked Lopez's cell phone data, and Lopez was in the area when Natalie had disappeared. With the damaging evidence about the cell phone, Lopez decided to talk to police. Lopez said he met Natalie from a Craigslist ad she posted, under men seeking women. 
The ad was titled, I want to put a hit on myself. Lopez messaged her back, and said he could help with that, that he used to be a hitman. She said she was extremely unhappy with her boyfriend, and her life, and wanted to end her life. On December 28th, Lopez met her at her apartment and they discussed how she wanted it to happen, and money, and she said she had her own firearm. Lopez said he tried to talk her out of it, but she was not gonna hear it. Lopez said they then drove around looking for locations, and couldn't decide on one, so he drove her home. But, there was a problem with his story, his cell phone had pinged in the exact location that her body was found. So, he had another story, they had found a spot, but, it was Natalie who had shot herself. Then police explained, that the trajectory of the bullet, made it impossible for Natalie to pull the trigger on herself. He then had another story, he had tried to convince Natalie to back out of it, but when he realized he couldn't, he agreed to help her. He said they prayed together, and then he closed his eyes, and he pulled the trigger. The wound was in the back of her head. The weapon he had used was still in his truck, and so was Natalie's purse. On February 8, 2018, Lopez was arrested for the homicide of Natalie Bollinger. He was later charged for first-degree murder, and sentenced to 48 years in prison. He escaped a life sentence, because he had pled guilty. Natalie's alleged Craigslist ad was never found by internet sleuths. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you enjoy these videos, drop a like in there too. Thanks for watching, and if you would like to see a certain video on something, leave it in a comment below. Until next time, stay safe.